Hi you guys, um, in this video I am going to go over the AP European History course and exam description. So this is a really long document. Um, what I would prefer to you to do while I'm talking about it here is either look over it before or during or after me talking about this because it's quite long um, just this video is not going to cut it a bulk of the information in this document is actually our curriculum I don't want you to get too worried about that when you're looking at the um, information that says like course framework and instructional approach approaches that's not really what I want you to focus on instead what I would like for you to make sure you're looking at is uh, the parts that here let me make sure I'm getting to where I need to be is the parts that say like this exam description so this begins on page 240 or exam information I mean page 240 this is what I want for us to focus on um, for this video is essentially what the exam is going to look like you have taken an AP exam before, but it wasn't necessarily an AP social studies. And the AP histories all pretty much have the same exam, AP world, AP US, and AP Euro all look basically the same. So for students who took AP US history, this exam will not be new to them, only the content will. If AP histories are new for you, then the whole thing is gonna be new. Um, so here's how the exam breaks down. It's two sections. This is pretty typical for um, an AP exam. Your AP Lang exam uh, was also two sections. So there's number one, section one I mean, and then part A, that's 55 multiple choice questions in 55 minutes. This weighs 40% of your overall exam total, which means that 60%, the other 60%, which is a bulk of your score, is actually writing. So it's actually more writing on the AP history exams, or it weighs more than it does on the AP English exams, which is kind of funny. Um, and you might think that doesn't make any sense, um, but really there is a lot of writing in history. Um, I mean, that's what history is, right? It's records of the past. So it makes sense that there would be a lot of writing in it. Um, I do want to note that each one of those multiple choice questions has a stimulus. Um, for example, there could be a primary source, a secondary source, or um, an image or graph. The image could be art or political cartoon or a photograph. Um, so there will be the stimulus, whatever that is, and then anywhere between two and five multiple choice questions that tie back to that stimulus somehow. So out of all, uh, you know, 55 questions, there will not be 55 different stimuli that you'll look at. Um, it will be less. So, like I said, you will start with multiple choice, then you'll move into the first writing section, which is short answer questions. Uh, the first short answer question will have you compare two secondary sources, most likely, um, and I'll show you an example of that in a minute. The second short answer question will have you analyze a primary source. Usually it's a visual, but it's not always a visual. Um, and then you'll have a choice between questions three and four. Neither of these questions will have stimuli. They will just be questions. Um, I also want to note that for all of the short answer questions that you will do here, one, two, and either three or four, each one of those has three components, an A, B, and a C. You are required to answer a, B, and C for each of them. So even though there's three short answer questions, there's really nine pieces to that. As you can see here, that's 20% of your exam score and you got 40 minutes to do it. That's close to 12 minutes a question. That's really not that bad. Um, I haven't really had students have a problem with the pacing for short answer questions in the past. We'll practice this a lot throughout the semester. You'll do one of these on every single quiz that you take for me. Um, so this this you'll get the most practice in. Um, then you'll have your 15 minute break like you normally do in an AP exam. Then you'll move into section two, which is more for your response questions. Uh, the first one is a document based question. A lot of students think this is the hardest essay. You might if you took AP Lang equate this to your um, 
what what was it called your synthesis essay where you had sources that you were using to write an essay um, but what you don't want to do is look at your dbq for the first time and write a synthesis essay <laughs> because they are quite different um, your dbq will be a prompt everyone will have the same prompt and you will not have a choice in the matter um, in what that is like you did in your short answer um, and then you'll have seven documents that go with that prompt. Um, there's no wrong answer as long as the answer responds to the prompt and is supported by the documents um, along with some outside evidence. You've got to use at least six documents in order to earn um, a perfect score on that. But this is a pretty standard like five paragraph essay. You get an hour to write your DBQ and it is uh, a quarter of your overall exam total. So of all the writing portions, this one's the biggest one. Um, like I said, a lot of students think this one's the toughest. I did when I was an AP history student in high school, but other students don't. They think that this one's not that bad because by giving you the documents, they're already giving you some ideas of things to write about, which is definitely helpful. Then you get to the very last essay, which we call our LEQ, or our long essay question. There will be three prompts, and they'll all be similar in one way or another. Again, I'll show you an example of that in a minute. But um, you will have uh, 40 minutes to write this essay, and there is no stimulus with it at all. There's no documents. It's just the prompt. You pick which one you want to do between questions two, three, and four. You answer that question with evidence that comes solely from your own knowledge. And again, that should be a pretty standard five paragraph essay. So I always felt like this, this essay was easier when I was in high school because you could write about whatever you wanted, but other students find this one more difficult because again, the information has to come from your, from your own knowledge. If you don't have the knowledge of the content, then you won't have anything to say in this essay, which could make it quite difficult. Now, before I move too much further into uh, how the exam is going to look, I do want to talk about um, how our course is going to be structured. Um, there's kind of two ways that the course is structured is both chronologically and thematically. Um, some teachers uh, run this course entirely chronologically. Some do it entirely thematically. I will do a blend of both. I personally find that to be the easiest. Um, so here are our themes as laid out by College Board. Um, interaction of Europe and the world. So anything that's going on in Europe and the rest of the world, whether we're talking about um, trading systems or wars or anything like that, that's part of that theme. Um, two, economic and commercial development. So this is usually, you know, industry, business, things like that. Three, cultural and intellectual development. So, you know, stuff like the Enlightenment or art movements. Four, states and other institutions of power. Here we're talking about government, whether it's monarchies or other forms of government. Five, social organizations and development. This could be, um, you know, movements or religion or other groups. Uh, six is national and European identity. That's kind of self-explanatory, uh, whether that's like uh, people's identity in their ethnic group, you know, what it means to be ethnically Polish versus what it means to be part of the European identity as a whole. And then the last one is technological, technological and scientific innovation. So we're talking about inventions and things like that. Um, all right, then we get to our chronological units. Um, this is a little bit different from uh, what my A push kids saw in that course. That was nine periods, and each period got a unit. This is actually four periods, but still nine units. You can see some of these periods actually cross multiple units, but pretty much every unit is going to be way it's going to be reflected the same amount like you'll see about as much renaissance and exploration on the exam as you see industrialization and its effects on the ap exam so this is how we've got our course laid out this is what a uh, college board, you know, has decided to make the most sense. So these are the units that we're going to follow. Um, I've given you a pacing guide. Um, well, I've made the pacing guide. I'm not sure when you're watching this if you'll actually have access to it 
or if that's something that you won't see until January, but nevertheless, you will get a pacing guide that will tell you um, exactly, um, and I'll also post in Canvas, but it will tell you exactly what dates each of your tests are going to be for each of these units. We will have a test for every unit and at least one quiz, maybe two or three for each unit also, um, depending how long it takes us to get through it. Um, any of these, even though all these weigh the same um, on, on the exam, some of these are a little bulkier than others. Um, for example, this 20th century global conflicts unit, unit A, um, both world wars are, are in that unit. That's really big. Um, and, uh, and, you know, the uh, right here, the late 18th century stuff, we're looking at multiple revolutions in unit five. That's also pretty bulky. So some things like that might be a little longer than other units, but um, just because the the content, I guess, is a little more detailed. So I just want you to see what these units look like. Again, these are in your syllabus. They're going to be on your pacing guide. I'll have them posted in Canvas. But if you're ever unsure of them, they're also in your book, and they're right here in the exam description. Okay, this is another uh, important page to look at. I think this is page 246, if I can see correctly. Um, this is the skills that you're going to be expected to demonstrate on the AP exam. Um, it's all laid out here and exactly how you would see it in multiple choice questions versus how you would see it in free response questions. This is really helpful, um, and especially for those of you who haven't taken an AP history before, I encourage you to look at this. Some of them will be really straightforward, like argumentation. You wrote argument essays in English. You know how to make an argument and how to support one. Um, you uh, know what a claim is. You know what evidence and sources looks like. So some of that stuff is not going to be necessarily new. But other things like contextualization might be new. Um, contextualization, for example, is um, something that you're going to do in the winter assignments. This is the first thing you do in either your DBQ or your LEQ. It goes at the very beginning of your essay. Most students put this in your um, opening paragraph. That's how we're going to learn it and how we're going to practice it. Um, like you can see right here, it says, in the DBQ and the LEQ, um, students are asked to describe a broader historical context relevant to the topic of the question. So essentially what that means is if your essay is about, I'll use some American history examples since you've already taken American history and that's content that's more familiar to you. Um, if our essay is about, um, let's say, uh, the Cold War, we got to write an essay about the Cold War. If we're going to contextualize that, if our prompt is talking about the Cold War, so it starts in 1945, which is when we would kind of consider the beginning of the Cold War to be, um, establishing broader historical relevant um, you know topics and information might be to explain to the reader what's going on before we drop in in 1945 you know kind of build up to it if you have watched I don't know like any TV show ever um, that's not a um, you know sitcom or something like that so like you know when they do the like previously on Grey's Anatomy or previously on Riverdale <laughs> and they kind of like give you all of the clips of the important things that have gone on in the last few episodes to remind you of what you need to know before you watch the new episode that's what contextualization is um, you know I'm not going to um, if I'm going to write an essay about the Cold War, I'm not going to talk about what women have been going through during World War II. While World War II is relevant, um, women, it doesn't necessarily tie back to the topic of my question, right, of my prompt. If the Cold War is what I'm talking about, um, maybe I, in my contextualization, I would want to talk about the relationship between the United States and the Soviet Union during World War II. Um, that might be something to talk about or really war in general, what war looked like for the United States during World War II. That might be how I want to phrase my contextualization. But it's kind of like giving your reader um, a bigger picture for what's going on. Most students find it easiest to focus on the before of the time period when looking at this, like the example that I just gave you. I want to be clear, that's not the only way to earn the point. Um, there are other, other ways to show contextualization, but most students find that that is the easiest. On the next page, you're going to see something that says task verbs used in free response questions. Make sure you take a look at this before you start in your um, winter assignments because these are all words that are used. 
Um, if you're asked to explain something, what does that really mean? What does College Board mean when they say explain? Um, what does College Board mean when they say evaluate? So these are important words to look at and really understand what the meaning of is. So I'm not going to go through each of these. You can read these on your own, but I want to draw attention that this is a very helpful place in the um, exam description document. Okay. So when you get to page 248, you're going to see sample exam questions. It's going to show you multiple choice, exactly like I talked about, right? We've got a primary source here from 1516, and it has four different multiple choice questions that all tie back to this somehow. Um, we'll go over multiple choice and best strategies for that at a later time, but I just want you to at least kind of see how things work. This is another example. This one's not a reading portion, right? This is um, a graph. I mean, I don't want to call it a graph, but a, a chart, I guess. Um, and then more multiple choice questions that tie back to the chart, more reading with uh, multiple choice questions that tie back to the reading. Uh, but now I want to get to the sample writing questions because that is what you are going to do for your winter assignments. So this first one here is showing a sample short answer question. This has a, a poster here, a propaganda poster. It says produced for Spanish anarchist group in 1936. So this is during the Spanish Civil War, which was going on during the interwar period. Um, I can hear it now already, right? Somebody being like, oh my gosh, she's got us doing this and I don't speak Spanish and this poster. Okay, first of all, I'm not going to be asking you to do this for your winter assignment. But College Board knows that most of you don't speak Spanish. <laughs> okay, if you do, awesome. This is going to help you. You have a leg up. Um, you're bilingual, at least, right? But, um, but if College Board thinks that the wording in something which is written in a different language is crucial to the understanding of the document, they'll put an English translation there. So don't freak out. Um, but you can see right here, this is where your writing portions are. This is all one question, right? Number two, uh, you have to answer A, B, and C. A, describe the historical situation in Spain reflected in the poster. So in A, what you would do is describe what is happening. This is an anarchist poster um, that's anti-fascist in 1836. I mean, sorry, in 1936. So this is talking about the Spanish uh, Civil War. That's what you would write about in A. It should not be more than two to three sentences, three to four sentences. That's really the sweet spot for each of these um, letters here. Then for B, describe one way in which the poster reflects broader historical developments in Europe. So then you've got to connect this poster specifically to other things. If this poster is, you know, talking about um, being anti-fascist, well, fascism was not only in Spain. We were also seeing fascism pop up in Germany, Nazi Germany. We were also seeing fascism pop up in Italy. So what you should do is specifically tie the poster, which is talking about fascism. Here's the word right here. Um, I don't speak Spanish, and so I can even pull that one out. Um, tie the poster back to other things. Be specific in what you see in the poster and how that is reflective of other things going on. Um, and then C, explain one way in which the artist's political affiliation influenced the view expressed in the poster. So it says right here at the top, this poster is made by an anarchist. How would someone who's an anarchist impact their opinion of the situation of the Spanish Civil War going on at this time? That's what that's asking. Again, for all three of these, A, B, and C, your answer should be between two and three sentences. They do need to be complete sentences. And our AP exam, we're going to take on a computer, A, B, and C in total cannot be more than 850 words. It will cut you off. So um, I've definitely seen plenty of students write too little. Um, one sentence is not going to get it done for any of these. You cannot just say for A that the historical situation going on is the Spanish Civil War. You can't just say there's a civil war in Spain happening between this side and this side, and that's in the poster. That's not enough. Um, like I said, go back to those task words that um, college board gave. That's not enough for really describe. Um, so make sure you're giving the reader what they need to know that you know about the material. Um, so like I said, two to four sentences for each of these is your safe zone, your sweet spot, and this whole thing should take you around 12 minutes.
Okie doke. Then we get into section two. This is uh, what your DBQ and your LEQ look like. There's just, there are samples of these here that you can just see. You're not going to do these now, but you could just see what they look like. Um, you know, here's the prompt right here. Evaluate whether the 30 years war was fought primarily for religious or primarily for political reasons. So there's no wrong answer here. You can argue religious or political reasons. You just have to be able to support your answer. And what are you supporting your answer with? These documents. So this is like document one. Two, you can see none of these are super long. Three, four, five, six, that one's an image. And then seven, you've got to use at least six of these documents to support your answer in order to get a perfect score. But we'll talk more about that later on in the semester. Then we've got an LEQ. Um, remember I told you you're going to get options, um, but here in this sample, they just show one question, and it'll look just like this. Evaluate the most significant long-term effect of the French Revolution during the period 1815 to 1900. There will be two other questions that might revolve around the same topics. So let's say questions three and four are also about revolutions. They just might be about different revolutions, but they'll, it'll also be asking for long-term effect of revolutions. Or maybe um, it'll be about also the French Revolution, but different aspects of it. Um, or maybe it'll also just be about French history, but different time periods. That's kind of how those uh, long essay questions work. So they'll all have one thing in common, but they will all be a little bit different. Okay, now I want to uh, show you some more examples of SAQ questions. Now, these are actually from American history um, <clears throat> because these are some that I'm uh, working on actually with my A push question, but the format's the same. Maybe this will be a little easier um, anyway to understand so that this is already content you're familiar with. So I showed you one that included an image, a primary source image. Um, now I'm going to show you an example of what the secondary source SAQ looks like. So we've got two secondary sources over here, one from historian Elaine Crane, one from Rosemary Zagari, um, one from 1998, one from 2007. Neither of them are long. You read each of those and then you answer these questions here, A, B, and C. A will always ask you the major difference between their two arguments. B is going to ask you to come up with some type of evidence that supports the first argument and C is going to ask you to come up with some type of evidence that supports the second argument. Now a lot of students fall into a, a kind of a trap where they might read the first one and think that okay well the second one must be the opposite but there's not really an opposite always in history it just might be different like if I said that um let's see I don't want to say slavery because that's too broad let's say that I argued that the compromise of 1850 was um the biggest um cause of the civil war um, someone else could, that's not wrong, it's definitely a cause, right? And I could make the arguments that it is the biggest cause. Someone else could make the arguments that it was, um, you know, uh, the publishing of Uncle Tom's Cabin or Lincoln Selection. You know what I mean? There's no opposite of that argument I'm making. There's just different arguments. So I'm going to go ahead and, and read actually these two and kind of talk about the differences here so you can understand what I'm saying. Um, so what does um, historian Crane say? The revolutionary moment, the revolution here, um, obviously we're talking about the American Revolution. Again, this is AP U.S. history. The revolutionary moment was neither radical nor a watershed for American women. Those who disregard America's commitment to patriarchal rule and plead for a historical interpretation that favors enlightened exceptionalism have overlooked the conditions that made large-scale change all but impossible at that time and place. So what's Elaine saying? She's saying the Re American Revolution wasn't a big deal for women. It was not a, a huge moment of change. That's what watershed means. It's kind of like a big moment of change. Um, and again, fair argument to make. You, there's definitely evidence that would support that. Now let's see, see what Rosemary says. She says, the coming of the American Revolution created new opportunities for women, for women to participate in politics. Responding to men's appeals, women engaged in a variety of actions in support of the revolutionary cause, which led women to experience a greater sense of connection to and involvement with the polity, which is like another word for the government or um, the politic, meaning the people participating in the government. After the war, their political contributions were praised, celebrated, and remembered. Women now were seen as political beings who had the capacity to influence the course of the war politics and history. All right. 
both of these are valid. Both of these have plenty of evidence that you could um, make. Um, Crane is saying the American Revolution wasn't a really big deal for women. Meanwhile, Zagari is saying this actually created new opportunities for women and allowed them to access politics for the first time. So in that first one, that's what the difference would be. That's that in A, I would explain what each of their arguments is and why those are different. In B, what's something that would support Crane's argument? Well, I would say Crane arguing that um, the American Revolution was not an important um, moment for women would be supported by the, you know, fact that women are not included in the founding documents, you know, women were not included in the Declaration of Independence, not in the Articles of Confederation and not in the Constitution. Um, and that wasn't an accident, right? They didn't forget about women. Um, they intentionally did not give women more rights. So, by me dropping the names of those documents, I'm showing that I'm smart. I'm including specific factual information or SFI, which you need to support your answer. I can do that in two to three sentences. Then C, briefly explain how one event or development or circumstance supports um, Zagari's argument. Again, you got to make sure all your evidence is, is spinning in that um, that time frame here 1765 to 1800 um but what's something that would support her i could talk about um the daughters for Li daughters of liberty who were a protest group during the american revolution right i could talk about um specific women who i know were involved in the american revolution whether it's um the wives of some of our founders like martha washington or abigail adams or i could talk about um other moments of political activism like the Edmonton Tea Party, which was the first moment of um, organized political action by women in the colonies. It was actually in North Carolina, but I've got a variety of options here, right? As long as I can explain it and can explain how it supports Zakari's argument in two or three sentences, maybe four, then I'm good and I've done it. Each of these SAQs is graded on three points, meaning you get a point for A, a point for B, and a point for C. So either you did it or you didn't do it. You're, there's no partial credit for each A, B, and C. You either did enough to get the point for A or you didn't. Now I'm going to show you examples of what um, that last type of SAQ looks like. All right, now every um, non-stimulus SAQ won't be a comparison question, um, but this is a pretty good example. Sometimes they are a comparison question, so that's one that I'll have you look at here. So you can see there's nothing to read. There's just three parts to the questions. You gotta answer each A, B, and C, and again, each of those need to be between two and four sentences. So A, briefly describe one difference between the economy of the British North American col colonies and the Chesapeake. It literally tells you like Virginia and Maryland versus the economy in the middle colonies of Pennsylvania and New York. So I could just say that, um, and again, I would, you know, write this out in two to three sentences. The way I say it right here might be in one sentence, but I would write it in two to three. Um, but what I would say is that uh, Chesapeake colonies like Virginia and Maryland, they were focused on um, large scale commercial farming. We were seeing plantations, they were growing cash crops like tobacco and things like that. Meanwhile, in the middle colonies, what we were seeing was um, uh, smaller farming, uh, more diversity in the economy. We saw um, the farming we saw was mostly wheat farming, uh, medium sized farms. We also saw some shipping and trading. Um, all right, B, just briefly describe one similarity between the economy of uh, the Chesapeake and the economy of the middle colonies. Labor systems, that relates to the economy. I would say since both uh, the Chesapeake colonies as well as the middle colonies were doing agriculture, they both relied on slave labor. Um, the Chesapeake definitely had many, many more enslaved people, but the middle colonies definitely still had plenty of enslaved people doing their uh, manual labor for them. And then C, briefly explain one reason for a difference in the economy of the Chesapeake and the economy in uh, the middle colonies. Well, I explained that they were doing different kinds of agriculture. An easy way to explain that is because um, of the environment. You know, I might say that uh, the 
um, waters around the middle colonies were better for trade. So we saw more trade happening in the middle colonies, like in cities like Philadelphia versus when we, what we saw in Virginia. Or I could say, um, you know, we saw large commercial cash crop farming in colonies like Virginia and Maryland because the land was more conducive to that. The physical environment was more conducive to that than it was in colonies like New Jersey or uh, Pennsylvania, where it was just in a different type of climate altogether. So again, each of these, um, I'm clear about my answer. I'm writing in complete sentences. I'm giving specific facts, right? I'm saying words like, um, enslaved people in labor system. I'm, I'm saying commercial farming, um, cash crops, cotton. I'm being specific. I'm not talking vaguely, but I'm also not going on and on and on and, and giving a crazy amount of details. That's the, the key to these SAQs. They really are short answer questions. You do not need to be super elaborative in, with them, but you do need to show that you're answering the question clearly and give specific examples in each of them. Okay, guys, so I know that was kind of long, 30 minutes, honestly, um, I could talk about the exam <laughs> and the course a lot longer than that, but I've hit you with the highlights. I think I've done an okay job on filling you in on some things that the AP US kids will already be familiar with. But again, this is this course and exam description is going to have a lot of your answers. If you have questions about any of this, please ask me. Um, call, text, email. I know you know a million different ways to get in touch with me. So if you have questions about something that I said or something you see in the exam description, please um, uh, let me know. But here's my final disclaimer. This is a big document. I told you it could be really helpful, but I want to be clear. This is usually a document just for teachers, right? This is the document that I use to create our course and to make sure I know what we need to be covering in class. So I don't want you to look at this and feel overwhelmed or anything like that. Don't get caught up, like I said, in the framework or instructional approaches. Those are not really things for you, right? Those are things for me. Let me worry about that. I will. Um, as long as you know how the exam is going to be structured, um, you're going to be in good shape. And for these first attempts at how to do some of this writing, don't be hard on yourself. Don't worry too much about the time. Don't worry too much about the content. Focus on the skills um, because once you've got that, you can kind of plug whatever content and time um, you need to stick to in with any of those. Like I said, hit me with any questions that you have after watching this, and I look forward to our class.